Welcome to the Education of a Financial Planner, where we look at the major concepts in financial planning through the lens of two quant investors who are learning the ropes of the planning process and how to help clients achieve their long-term goals. Learn along with us as experienced financial planner Matt Ziegler helps us understand the most important financial planning concepts that impact all of us and how we can apply them to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. In each episode, we will work through one major financial planning concept from the ground up and learn how we can apply it in the real world. From retirement to college savings to taxes to estate planning, we will cover a wide range of topics that apply to each of our everyday lives. We hope you will join us in our learning journey. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at the Lydia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investment. This week on the podcast, we've got Ben Terrell of FranNet to talk to us about franchising. Now, why franchising on a financial planning podcast? because lots of people want to be business owners. They want to be their own boss and not all of them have executable business ideas. And that's just what franchises in their simplest form are. So there's a ton to learn here. We learned a lot in this conversation and make sure you stick around to the end because I'll reveal the best meta franchise movie probably of all time. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Justin. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Usually, Jack, Matt, and I are uh, on the podcast talking about financial planning topics and strategies, but today's discussion is going to be something uh, very different, but we think it's uh, a topic that a lot of people are interested in learning about, and we're going to talk a lot about the basics of that, and that is franchises and how many people think about you know entering or looking at franchises um, and buying into them. So. I think this is going to be fun. It's certainly something I don't know a lot about. You know, I was thinking, I know just in the last 10 years, I've, I've got to know two people. One gentleman uh, owned a number of Red Robins here in the Northeast, and another one owned um, some Moe's. It's like a, you know, it's kind of a fast food restaurant chain, uh, mostly in Connecticut. Um, so that's the only really experience I have with franchises is kind of, you know, getting to know these guys and getting to know a little bit about the business is that they're in. What's sort of also interesting, I was thinking about this is like, I have young children and, you know, you see these kids things pop up, whether it's trampoline parks or some other concept. And you're like, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. And then you kind of dig into a little bit more and you realize that there's a franchise um, behind it. So that's going to be the, I think the main thrust of our conversation today. The only thing I, I kind of want to say here is I do think this, you know, plays into, and the, the sort of the overall theme of our podcast is education about financial planner. So I would imagine, I know this isn't your area of expertise per se, but you know, I would imagine when someone is looking at buying into a franchise, putting an investment up, um, expanding their franchise footprint, you know, the planning and financial planning part of it probably is a very, very important aspect to how people consider this, where the, where's the money coming from, how they financing it, if they're bringing in outside capital, you know, all those things, which, you know, that's really like financial and strategic planning. So we'll sort of get into that, um, with you too. So again, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. This is going to be great. Yeah, that's great, Justin. And, uh, happy to, happy to talk about this. It's my favorite topic. I've spent a portion of my adult life uh, thinking about these things. Um, you're absolutely right about the financial planning. Uh, this is an investment. Uh, it's a huge investment. It's a life-altering investment for many people. Uh, and so it requires very careful financial planning. So happy to talk through all these issues. Yeah, and I would imagine since, um, you know, this is just kind of a comment, since COVID, you know, a lot of people sort of looked at their life and said, you know, maybe they want to work for themselves, do something different. So I think that there's, you know, you have these periods of time where you probably see more people interested in things like franchises and doing something on their own than necessarily going into a big company and working for someone else. Absolutely. Um, you know, COVID really changed the whole landscape of how business is done. Uh, the four of us are sitting in our residences, it looks like, having this conversation. That might not have been the case five or 10 years ago. Um, you, you have these sort of once in a generation uh, situations where you sort of upend, uh, you know, what, what people think about traditional business and traditional career. And what COVID did was it, it took a lot of people out of, you know, a traditional, you know, eight to five sit in an office employment 
And when they got home, you know, they had a variety of reactions. I mean, some people decided that they loved being at home and some people decided that they couldn't stand being at home. And regardless of where you felt about that, you realized that there were a lot of other ways to think about career and think about your life and think about business. And it's not, uh, it opened up, I should say, sort of an entrepreneurial spirit among a lot of people. You know, if I can have more flexibility in my day, more flexibility in how I choose to, you know, operate from nine to five, um, then that's uh, something that I find valuable. Uh, and, and so people started looking at entrepreneurship sort of writ large. I mean, you had a whole group of people that were becoming Uber drivers and were becoming DoorDash uh, drivers. And, and that's sort of on one end. And on another end, it's, well, um, I'm, I want to do something on my own. Uh, and, and, and the other thing with COVID is because of the nature of how people were working from home, they, they, they had a little bit more time. They had a little bit more flexibility uh, sort of thrust upon them. And they took advantage of that by, by taking a look at what was out there. And so the entrepreneurship in general went up during COVID and franchising, franchising went up uh, certainly as, as one of several ways that people might choose to get into business for themselves. I love this idea of just connecting because we talk in finance about the connection between capital and labor and where this fits in so in a huge way for financial planning conversations is this intersection. You have capital on one end, you have labor on the other. And when we talk about human capital and we've done some whole episodes really deconstructing this thing. It's that idea of like, as you move from labor into skilled labor into what do I bring to the table? It doesn't mean I have to go start Apple in my garage or the next trillion dollar company. I can progress from gig worker, gig economy to other things where I can own some asset. And this piece about like owning your time and figuring out other paths to do so, like that's why we wanted to have you on this conversation, to have this conversation, because yeah. it's so important you have options that aren't just start a tech company in your garage. Absolutely. I mean, when I, when I give um, sort of speeches and seminars to people, I talk about three pathways to business ownership. You know, there's the first pathway, which is what we think of building Apple in your garage or I've always wanted to open a comic book store and I'm going to take out a lease, you know, in my hometown, you know, sort of that uh, American dream of starting something from the ground up. There's also the second aspect of business ownership, which is in, which is buying an existing business. Uh, that's something that my father-in-law did. For example, he bought a manufacturing business. There's pros and cons to that. Franchising is sort of a hybrid of those two things. You are starting something from scratch. You are starting your own business but you're doing it within the confines of a brand that hopefully has, you know, some structure to it, some, um, you know, some history, some best practices. They've, people have made mistakes and they've learned from them and they've adapted and identified those things. And there's 10 or 20 or a hundred or a thousand other people in the country doing what you're doing. So you have that support network. You could call it kind of a mini board of directors. You've got other people helping you. So you are a business owner and you own your business and you're building it and it does become an asset, but it's within the confines of a system. And that works for a lot of people. It does not work for everybody. Franchising is not the right way for everybody to be an entrepreneur, but it is, um, it is one way and it is often an overlooked way because, you know, we may get into this, but there's a lot of different kinds of businesses and industries that are franchised that many people wouldn't even expect. Um, and sometimes people will assume, well, I, I don't want to be in franchising because I don't want to own a restaurant or I don't want to work with teenagers or I don't want to work weird hours. Okay. Well, there's lots of franchises that have nothing to do with that. So a lot of opportunity there. Um, and you're right. A lot of uh, people sort of came to a broader understanding of all of this uh, as a result of what we've been through the last few years. You just basically mentioned what I want to go to next, which is, you know, I, I always think about McDonald's when I think about franchises. You know, Justin mentioned Moe's and Red Robin. Like everybody tends to think about restaurants as the thing you franchise. But can, can you just talk about the, the more wider range of businesses that can be franchised? Absolutely. So, um, so franchise, so most people do think of restaurants. They think of retail they think of what you see when you're driving down the street in your town. 
Um, and that is certainly a portion of franchising. I don't know if it's 20%, 25%. It's certainly not the majority. Um, but it's kind of the tip of the spear because that's what people see. But franchising is more broad than that. So, um, you know, there are, for example, a lot of service-based franchises that don't have brick and mortar locations. Um, if you think about the people that come to your house to paint the house or to clean out the gutters or to re-asphalt your driveway or to spray your yard for mosquitoes or on and on and on, the people that might fix your washing machine, the people that might, you know, uh, stain your deck. I mean, a lot of those brands um, are franchise brands. A lot of them are household names and some of them aren't, but those are, th that's a segment. You also have what I would call personal services or business services. Uh, you have tutoring businesses, you have childcare businesses, you have senior care, everything related to the whole aging of America. You've got senior living, um, but you've also got personal services like spas and haircuts and, um, you know, things of that nature. Uh, you also have business services. So, for example, FranNet, the company that I am a franchisee of, is a franchise. There are um, expense reduction franchises. There are graphic design franchises. There are uh, signage manufacturing franchises. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, but the reality, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's it's far broader than just what you see when you drive down the street. And it's, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, trends that are kind of moving around within franchising where it's actually moving maybe even more and more away from the fast food retail. And that's always going to be a piece of it, but it's a, a minority of it for sure. So, so restaurants are actually like, if, if we would look at the total, all franchises out there, restaurants are less than half. Oh, far, far less than okay. half. Okay. It's interesting. It's less, I would have never guessed less, that. Yeah. It's less than a quarter probably. Um, can you just talk about the basics of the model? I mean, I, I know, and, and I may be completely wrong about this. When I think about it, I think, you know, I, I need some sort of upfront money. You know, I, I need to pay my way to get into this franchise. And then they probably take a percentage of my revenue, you know, once I start the franchise. But I'm sure there's a lot more going on than that. So can you talk about how the model actually works? Sir, sure. so, um, so broadly speaking, when you invest in a franchise, you are, you are sort of investing in, I would say, a license. You know, you, you, you work with McDonald's or whomever, and you, uh, have an, you come to an arrangement with them where you are buying the license to operate their model in a particular geographic area. Um, now they're not all geographic based, by the way, but, but if you sort of stick with me here for a second, a lot of them are, and that's kind of the traditional model. Now, uh, you invest in a franchise first and foremost with a franchise fee. That's a set amount and it's, it's written up for you. It's $30,000 or $40,000 or $50,000. You write a check that gives you the, uh, the, the, the license to hold for a period of time. And then there's also more investment that happens after that. I mean, if it is a brick and mortar location, you have to find the location. You have to build it out. You have to, you might have inventory. You might have, um, staff to hire. You might have this, that and the other. Um, but there will be a, a range of investment that they will quote for you. Uh, and then once you are up and running, the, uh, you, by and large, you do pay royalty payments uh, to the franchisor uh, in, in, in an amount that's a percentage of revenue. And it might be 6% or 7% or 8%. There's also typically other fees. All of this is governed by a document called the Franchise Disclosure Document. That's important for anybody listening to understand because the Federal Trade Commission requires all franchise brands in the United States to publish and make available a franchise disclosure document. It's a very dense, a very dry document. It's usually a hundred pages or more. Um, you can look at it and your eyes water and, you know, but it's important because what it spells out is the entire nature of what the relationship is going to be between the franchisee and the franchisor. So this is what the franchisor requires of the franchisee. This is what the franchisee can expect in return from the franchisor. Uh, here is a uh, history of the, of the company. I mean, this is everything about our leadership. This is, have we ever had bankruptcies? Have we ever had 
lawsuits? Have we ever had closures? Um, you know, and on and on. And, and, and there's usually not always, but usually a financial representation in there. So, um, you know, this is what, you know, the top 25% of our franchisees have, have done. Now they're not going to promise or guarantee a, a certain amount of, you know, income back to the owner. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the sky's the limit. I mean, it is your business. So, I mean, you can run with it and, 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 and do anything you want. Uh, but they're not going to guarantee it because you also might fail. And so what they can do is perhaps share with you some of some examples of what some people have done. But then there's also, uh, this is maybe getting too involved for your question, but there's also part of the process is validation where you're, uh, you know, where you're talking to existing franchisees and you're learning from them about what they've done. So, I mean, that's, that's the model in a nutshell. Interesting. So they'll, they'll give you the, the franchise company will help you figure out like, you know, in your location, is this a good place to do it? They may have, I assume they have national data probably in terms of where their other locations are, how they do, they can probably help you figure that out. I mean, because I, I assume like, you know, using McDonald's as an example, they're not going to let me put McDonald's across the street from another McDonald's. You know, yeah, they're going to probably really like recognize the right way to do it. Absolutely. So, so most, not all, but most franchises are territory based. So when you go into you know, a, a metro area. If you live in a metro area, I live in St. Louis, Missouri. If you, if you can look at St. Louis, Missouri and you can say, um, you know, they have very sophisticated demographic information, households, household income, you know, how many, what's the age range? What's the value of a home? What's the education level? And they have, they have taken every metro area in this country and even a lot of smaller towns and they've said, okay, we think that there could be one or two or three or however many of our concept, say, in the metro area. And then they further define it down. So they will show you a map of the territory that's available, and it will be a cut-up piece of your city based on whatever they know through their data, who their clients are, how many of their clients are needed to have a prosperous business, and they build these territories out. Now, then once you secure a territory or more than one, then they will help you refine that further by figuring out where to locate within that territory. So they're not going to put McDonald's right on top of each other. You know, they're going to spread them out. Uh, and they're also going to look at, I mean, if it's a retail business like that, they're going to look at traffic counts. They're going to look at the side, side of the street. They're going to look at the condition of the shopping centers around it. And many franchise brands have partnerships with national real estate people so they will help you with these things. When you invest in a franchise, you're investing in assistance in these types of things. So they will, they will help you in, in most cases. They will help you find the locations uh, based on what they've already understood to be their successful um, demographic mix. And does, does the franchisee typically work in the business? I mean, I've come across some people who own McDonald's in my life and you know, they own multiple McDonald's and they probably don't ever go in there. But I'd assume that's the exception rather than the rule. I would, I would assume most people do work in the business. Is that right? Well, so there's two, uh, there, there's two things to think about. There's, there's owner-operator franchise businesses and there's semi-absentee franchise businesses. If you're an owner-operator business, that means that you are doing the thing full-time. So whether it's a McDonald's or you know, a lawn care service or something, you know, the owner is actively involved in that business day, day after day. Uh, if it's a semi-absentee business, those are typically run by managers that are hired by the owner. Uh, and then the owner is, you know, comes in and out at their discretion. Um, you know, most franchise brands will tell you that even a semi-absentee business will require a certain uh, degree of time and in, in investment on the part of the owner because, you know, this is a huge investment on your part. You know, I, I would hope that you would would not be just completely passive, but, uh, but, but, it, but, it, but it, it, it depends. I mean, there's some models that really want you to be a full-time owner. And there are some models that are totally fine with being a semi-absentee, uh, business. Typically, uh, you know, retail and restaurant types of businesses will be a semi-absentee model, uh, you know, in some cases, because you're hiring a manager. I mean, if you have a, if you have a haircut place, you know, the, the owner of the supercuts does not cut the hair. And the owner of the supercuts does not even manage the people that are cutting the hair. The owner of the supercuts 
is managing the person that is managing the people that are cutting the hair. And that's not always a full-time job. So you're telling me my super cuts or cost cutters haircut is basically free money? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you know, so somebody is doing something else entirely and is, <laughs> is taking home the profit, but they've invested in it. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it's haircutting is like the vanguard of uh, absentee uh, passive. Well, I mean, there there are certainly people, and I know people that have multiple franchise brands that are in a variety of different places. I mean, you know, maybe they have a couple of haircut places and maybe they have a yogurt shop and maybe they have a, um, a service business of some sort. And, you know, they've installed managers at all these places and they just hover above all the managers and, and, you know, look at, look at strategy and, I mean, it's bigger picture thinking. I mean, you know, to do that requires a pretty significant amount of capital, but there's certainly a lot of people that do that. And especially with the, funny enough, I've, worked with some people who have done just that. And a lot of times it comes back down to what you said before, you're part purchasing this network. And so it's like you own the exercise place or the haircutting place and like the, you know, the strip mall or the facility that's next to a target or something else. And it's like, oh, we think this place could support this too. And then that franchisee goes out and goes like, oh, I could do the yogurt place and I could do the other place. Oh, pe people do that all the time. I mean, they, there's a, there's a term that we use called empire builders. I mean, um, you know, and, and, and there are, there are even, you know, there are, are like, for example, in the home services space, there are some larger franchise companies that own a number of, of brands in, in the vertical. And, you know, they might own a, uh, an HVAC company and a plumbing company and a, uh, roofing company and a landscaping company. And a lot of times, you know, the, the, the way that they've created their systems you know, the CRMs are integrated and the lead, the marketing is, is integrated. So if you, if you have one of their systems, you know, or one of their brands, um, getting a second brand is, is easier and a third brand is even easier and a fourth brand is even easier because you've built out a lot of infrastructure uh, behind it that's going to be the same thing, whether, you know, you're dispatching plumbers to a house or, you know, tree, tree trimmers to a house. Um, and, and so a lot of people will build an empire that way by 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 buying several concepts that all have the same end user and um and just doing several things at once for him i i love that we're talking about vertical and horizontal integration which is like the mid-level like cfa corporate strategy stuff but it it makes so much sense like that's yeah. that's an obvious case and example that's so cool ben yeah yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot more to this than a lot of people claim. Anyway, go on. Can you talk a little bit about the advantages of this over starting your own business? I mean, Matt doesn't seem optimistic about my plan to start Apple for my garage. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was pretty pumped up about it, but I think Matt's already rained on that parade. So, uh, but I am <laughs> optimistic about my plan to start a Burger King to sell your kids chicken nuggets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the uh, amount of chicken nuggets my son, my son eats, you, you probably could just put one like next door to my house. If you can get the zoning that's, approval and it would, it would probably work out. A boat but, is not going to buy itself, Jack. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> but can, can you talk about just some of the advantages of doing it this way versus starting your own business? Sure. I mean, I would say, you know, there's, there's several types of entrepreneur, right? I mean, something like, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get this number exactly right because it's been a while since I've seen it, but something like 60 or 70% of Americans at least would like to be their own boss, would like to, would like to start something. Of course, a far, far smaller percentage do because people are worried that they don't know what they don't know. Like, you know, um, they might know how to do a, a thing, but they don't understand how to do the things that will make that successful. So you might be uh, very comfortable um, mowing a yard, but you don't know how to market to find your customers and you don't know how to hire people to mow for you and you don't know how to structure your books. And so you don't, you, so people in that situation don't wind up starting a lawn mowing business because they're like, well, I can mow my neighbor's yards, but that's not going to get me anywhere because they, they don't understand how to build out a business. So a certain, certain group of entrepreneurs is going to figure that out because that's just who they are. But there's a, a far larger group of people that get sidetracked. They say, maybe I could build Maybe I do understand how to build a computer in my garage, but I don't know anything else about how to scale a business. So the type of entrepreneur that's drawn to a franchise system is one that says, 
uh, I have some basic knowledge of a few things. Like I, I know how to communicate. I can sell. Uh, I, I can maybe read a balance sheet. Um, so I have some soft, some kind of soft skill. Um, but I appreciate the fact that others know more than I do in, in any of those realms. And so I can take advantage of their expertise. So if you invest in a franchise and you're investing in a system, you understand that uh, there are some guardrails. Um, but there's trade-offs in everything. Uh, you know, you don't get to make every single decision. I mean, you can't decide to sell Chinese food at your Burger King. Um, but I've seen YouTube videos that suggest otherwise. But continue. <laughs> you, I mean, but you accept, but, but you accept that you are working within the confines of a system. But but that doesn't work for every entrepreneur. But it works for a huge number of people that might otherwise be sidetracked. I'll give you a personal example. I am not very good at technology. These are my wife's headphones. I don't even own headphones for a computer. They look great on you. I don't know. But um, my my point is that um, that runs the gamut. Like I. I would be sort of hard pressed on how to build my own website or how to how to research and implement a CRM system or how to do digital marketing. So my company, FranNet, of whom I am a franchisee, does these things for me. I don't have to build my website. I don't have to think about my CRM system. I don't have to. I mean, I have there's somebody that posts social media for me at eight o'clock every morning. I don't have to do that. So it takes certain things that I might be hesitant to do off my plate uh, and it makes it more reasonable for me to be a business owner because I, I can utilize the assistance and then do what I know how to do and a rising tide makes the investment go up. I want to put the highlighter on that exact point because I think it's so important and it's back to this trade-off between like capital and labor and human capital. These are all expenses. If you want to start your business from scratch and do these things, marketing and and uh, accounting and all these efforts you have to think of like as an expense either your own time or your outsourcing and hiring and part of this mm -hmm. franchise choice this decision to use an already existing process that you're buying in buying into or investing in is actually understanding these pieces what are expenses i'm going to have anyway and how much of this process solves for it in a way that the benefits to brain damage ratio to me is I can sort of like plug and get down to what I'm good at, which is why most people want to own a business in the first place. I am so glad you said that because when I explain franchising at the very beginning and I talk about the royalty payments that go to franchise systems and you're paying 6% of your revenue or 7% of your revenue, that turns people off. Like an initially, they're like, I don't want to have to pay somebody else because it's my business. But you're paying for things that you'd be paying for anyway. You know, I mean... You know, and if you're not paying for them anyway, you're probably not running your business in a very successful way. I mean, you have to have a website, right? So either the franchise brand is going to, with with scale and with their expertise, create a really, really good website for you, or you're going to spend an equal amount of money or more trying to cobble it together on your own when that's not even your expertise. So royalties get a bad name because nobody wants to pay money, but there's a reason why they exist, and it's not just to make the franchise or money, which of course it also does. But uh, it, it's to it's to help bring some of that into the um, the offering that helps the franchisee accelerate the growth of their business. What is the range in terms of upfront costs? I mean, you know, you you'll hear people talking, you know, about like McDonald's or something like that, which I think they said you need like a million dollars or something like that. But I would assume that's that's probably not the correct representation of the entire spectrum of what there could be. So what, what is the range of like different types of upfront costs there are to start a franchise? Yeah. I mean, so it, 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 it's all over the map. I mean, it really is, you know, the, the McDonald's of the world, the freestanding food, that's going to be the most expensive because you've got a lot of staff, you have a lot of, um, you know, machinery. I mean, you have to build a kitchen and you have to, you have a lot of inventory, um, and you have the real estate cost. Those things are the most expensive, but it, it, it scales all the way down to uh, a brand that may have no employees and you're working out of your house and uh, you have no products that you're buying. Um, so, I mean, the range is almost limitless, but you know, you can, you can, 
you can get into a franchise system for you know a twenty or thirty thousand dollars if you if you don't have a lot of other expenses, but it accelerates beyond that when you have to purchase a vehicle, when you have to hire two or three people, when you have to uh, build out a you know a, a model. Um, in general, uh, service brands tend to be less expensive than retail and product brands. Um, but you know, a brand that you could do for your home, like I'm sitting in my third bedroom here, um, is typically a, a less of an expensive investment than something where you have to have the real estate. You know, I, I think, you know, something else you you hit upon there. You know, you have to have a million dollars. You know, franchise brands also will look, irrespective of what it costs to get the business open, they will look at a balance sheet that a personal balance sheet. They will look at your your net worth and your liquidity. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to uh, have somebody invest every last penny that they have in their in their life, because then you're not setting yourself up for success. I mean, if you if you can't live for a while without income coming in and you know, so, so there's oftentimes network and liquidity uh, requirements. That's separate from whatever the investment is to get the business open. But it's something that from a financial planning point of view, you have to look at both of those things. I mean, you have to look at what does it cost to open and what kind of financing is required for that. But then how comfortable am I uh, with the idea that I might not make money right away? Uh, and, and so uh, there's two pieces to that. Do you typically, in terms of the upfront fees, do you typically see people finance those or do you see people who come in with cash a lot of the time to do that? Oh, I mean, it varies. Um, I mean, the, the upfront fee is, the upfront fee itself is usually a nominal enough number that people who are, you know, operating on the scale that we're talking about can usually do that on their own. I mean, it might be $50,000. Um, and that's, I'm not to suggest that that's not a lot of money because it is a lot of money, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not millions and millions of dollars. I mean, the rest of the investment comes later as you're building a business out. It is more often the case that that is financed in some way. But a lot of times the whole thing is financed. I mean, if somebody decides to, you know, get a loan or utilize their retirement funds or something like that, you know, they're kind of thinking of it writ large, not just one piece of that or the other. Um, but But it is true that the the franchise fee itself is kind of a one-time thing. I mean, that's a very easy, got to pay this money, you know, to to get the license to start. And that's that's a very, e it's not easy. There's a, that's, that, you write one check and you, you've done that part of it. Um, so a lot of times the the rest of the investment comes in stages as you're building it out. Uh, and that's more, maybe more likely to be financed. Is, is the balance sheet um, just like liquid cash on hand or will they look at things like, retirement assets and or equity in a house or how do they they'll, uh, they'll look they'll look at all of it they'll look at all of it and and in every franchise system has slightly different criteria that they look at um i mean they really want to know that you're not getting it over your head whatever that looks like and the other thing is i mean franchising you know when you when you go to invest in a franchise i mean it's like a job interview i mean it's they'll look at somebody and they'll They'll make a determination, you know, how serious of an individual are you? What's your background? You know, in, in certain ways, it's a leap of faith. You know, can, you know, can we, can we sort of trust you that you're going to be able to, to get this done? Um, and so, you know, sometimes they have very specific requirements. You know, we will not talk to you if you do not have $200,000 of liquid money that you could get tomorrow if you need to. And sometimes they're more flexible. Uh, depending on the whole raft of other attributes that you bring. Um, but usually it's some combination of those things. This is probably an impossible question because the range, the range is probably all over the charts. But in terms of the payback period, I'm sure when people do this, they think about, all right, I'm going to put some money up front. Over time, I'm going to make some profits. I'm going to pay myself back. Like, How do you think about that discussion with people who are considering franchises? Well, I always try to be honest in everything that I do. I, I try to be very honest up front with people and say, you know, you're not going to make a whole lot of money right away. Uh, you're not going to draw a paycheck you know, a week after this, this business has started. Um, you, you've got, you've got to have, you've got to have some money. Um, but, but, but some brands, 
because of the way they're structured, get to profitability, just generally speaking, fast. And I'll give you an example. There are some uh, exercise, some boutique fitness brands uh, that have a very they have a recurring revenue model, a membership model. You've seen these, perhaps you belong to these. Everybody on this listening to this might belong to something like this. The you know the cycling gyms and the boxing gyms and the rowing gyms and whatnot, the fitness gyms. A lot of times, those you know they they know that in order to break even, they have to have a certain number of members because it's a recurring revenue model. You join and it's a, it's a it's an every month thing. Uh, there are brands out there that will say, okay, you have to have 100 members to join. We're not going to let you open until you have secured 100 people from pre-sales. So in that situation, in that scenario, you're much more likely to be breaking even at the very beginning because they have figured out the exact number. If it's a recurring revenue model, they know you have to have this many members. Uh, that is an easier brand, like if, if you're really concerned about making money as soon as possible, or at least not being in debt, as you're, you'll be in debt anyway, probably, but you, not being in the hole, um, then uh, you, you think about something like that, as opposed to, you know, if you are, if you have a signage manufacturing franchise, of which there are several, and you know, uh, some signs are $50 and some signs are $500 and some signs are $500,000 and you don't really know who your client's going to be yet. You've got to go find those people. That's going to be a slightly longer ramp up period, probably. Um, but so, so the type of person that would be more comfortable with that kind of an investment might be a different person than might be more comfortable with, you know, the prior example of the, the gym. Um, so, but then there's a lot of other factors about what's appealing to you and what kind of business do you want to do. And, this is why, I mean, due diligence, just as a general rule, it's very, very, very important. Um, but it, it kind of goes in all directions. But I would never, I, mean, I, I would be hesitant to uh, advise somebody to get into the business that, that, that needs to be making money in the first three months or six months. I would say it is really, you know, you're really going to be walking a fine line. I would assume this is one of the big advantages here of marketing I'm going to talk about, but how much of this usually falls on like the person for marketing and how much of it falls on the franchise? Like how much does the franchise bring from a marketing perspective? Like I assume going back to the example of McDonald's, like I put my McDonald's in the corner. I'm not going to start buying ads in the local newspaper. People are just going to come to my McDonald's. Like that one pretty much they handle it for you. But how, how does that range work in terms of the different franchises that are out there? So a lot of, a lot of the, the service brands and the retail brands, both, a lot of them have gotten very, very good at, you know, creating systems that drive, that drive traffic. I mean, they, you know, it, if it's a, if it's a home service brand or if it's a retail brand, you know, those are not brands where by and large, the franchise owner is out there actively finding every, you know, you have the whole range of SEO and pay-per-click and social media and digital media. And some of these franchise brands even have call centers and they will set up the leads for you. I mean, if you if you see a van driving down the street and it's 1-800-I-NEED-A-PLUMBER and you need a plumber and you call 1-800-I-NEED-A-PLUMBER, you know, there's likely to be a call center somewhere, maybe even overseas, that is learning about you, setting up, you know, figuring out what you're looking for, setting up an appointment, routing. They know that the 1-800-I-NEED-A-PLUMBER franchise in you know, your town, they know who you are and they can see your uh, drivers and your employees. And sometimes they set up all the appointments for you. And, and there's quite a bit of, there are quite a bit of those kinds of businesses out there. Um, but it also scales all the way to the other end of the spectrum. If you have a business that, you know, requires somebody to literally go find every client on their own. Uh, and there are benefits to that kind of business as well, but um, but you know, digital marketing might not be the benefit. Um, so it, it it runs the gamut, but it, in many cases, um, you know, the the franchise systems have gotten sophisticated enough that they that if you're looking for something that does not require a lot of boots on the ground sales, you can find it. 
How does, I'm just curious, is there data in terms of how failure rates work with this relative to a normal small business? Like we know failure rates are pretty high in a normal small business, but I would assume going back to the example with Matt, if, if Matt's going to open Burger King for my kids next door, he's probably got a better chance than Matt's chicken nugget kitchen or, or whatever he starts on his own to try to deliver it. So, but is there any data around that? Like, is this, is this a more successful model? I'm going to remind you that McDowell's was a very successful competitor to the McDonald's <laughs> in America. Very yeah, but successful. He was, but he was stunning the McDonald's book in the bathroom. Remember that? Um, he was, but not a franchise until uh, he may have gone on to franchise in an alternate universe. I'm not sure. That's right. Um, uh, uh, now I've lost track of the question. Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just- I was just wondering about the like the failure rates of doing it this way versus people starting their own business. Yes. So um, I do not have the data on my fingertips, but there is data. And the data will show that it is a significantly uh, higher success rate for franchise brands than a mom and pop. I mean, it's it's something on the order of it's it's it's. Well, I don't I don't want to say a number because I don't know it, but it's 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 much, much more likely that you will be successful with a franchise than with a mom and pop. Um, just because of everything we've talked about. I mean, the systems that are in place, the 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 brand identity, the the you know, the the best practices that they bring to the table and show you, the fact that you've got a whole lot of other people out there doing what you're doing so that you can call on them. I've told you before, FranNet's a franchise. I own the St. Louis location of FranNet, but if I have a question about something, I might call the Dallas owner or the Los Angeles owner or the Chicago owner and talk through things with them. So having all of these systems, having all these support systems in place um, really does give you a greater likelihood of success. Now, there's no guarantee to success. Um, there are plenty of franchises that fail, um, but um, the, the data which is out there will show that it is a, a you have a higher likelihood of success with a franchise brand than doing something on your own. Yeah, this has been really great. Like I mentioned before we started recording, like I know nothing about franchises, so I, I know a lot more now. So th- this is this has been really helpful. Just uh, But as we wrap up, I want to also ask Matt a little about this in, from the perspective of financial planning, because I know you and Matt coming together on this was was what got you onto the podcast. And so I just want to ask Matt, like, how do you think about this? when you When you have clients who are looking at something like this, how do you think about this as part of a financial plan? In the... The framework we talk about all the time on this YouTube channel, calendar, cash flow, balance sheet. If you're thinking about a franchise and we have clients who have done this and from both directions too, like you can franchise an existing business or you can buy a franchise as a ways to do it. You're, you're looking on the balance sheet at an asset. And if you're going to buy a franchise or, or start any business, we talk about that and kind of like reverse engineer it from the balance sheet. There's a psychological component to this that is huge. And the way, the way I like to position it is I talk about, let's talk about the boom scenario because that's why we're having the conversation. Somebody always has an idea that's going to pay off and be awesome. So let's talk about the boom. Let's talk about what it looks like, top line down to bottom line, how that works. How's this asset going to get converted into cash flow and then grow on your balance sheet? And then we got to talk about the bus scenario and what happens if this thing goes wrong. How much of a hole is this going to blow in your ship if you decide not to do, if I do Matt's chicken shack or whatever the idea was (laughs) next to your house and your kids are like, what is this off brand garbage that dad keeps pushing on us? (laughs) If I make that choice and this thing goes bust, there's a big difference between I put $50,000 down up front and I don't know, put a bunch on a credit cards because Matt's chicken shack doesn't really vet me very well or I started myself. That's a different size risk than if I make a bigger capital commitment and what does that do for me? Just like any investment, by the way, right? Like it's just another investment. So the boom scenario, the bus scenario, and then the one that's sneaky and uh, Ben, please like feel free to comment on this. Talk a lot about the break-even scenario because what we see a lot of times with startups, whether it's a franchise or not, but especially in franchises, because you have a model it's probably at least sort of working out the gate. And if it's sort of working out the gate, you might be at break even for how much of an extended time. And that could impact your ability to do a draw, to pay yourself a salary, or to grow the enterprise value. And as break even tilts between 
I'm making a little bit of money and I might be able to accelerate it or I'm losing a little bit of money, what happens as it accelerates towards boom or towards bust? That middle ground can be really hard to sit in for a long time. And so from a financial planning perspective, it's understanding what we're creating on the balance sheet, how it's going to get built, how it's going to come off or convert or be exchanged or traded or sold or whatever down the road. And then under that boom, bust and break even scenario, what are the parameters? Because just like with everything with financial planning, we want to not necessarily pre-commit to decisions, but pre-commit to the guardrails so that if I open that store and your kids get a hold, Jack, of your, of your credit cards and they are just buying chicken nuggets like crazy, I might go, whoa, I got to cash out and you know call Ben and sell this franchise tomorrow because I don't know about this customer base and I want to ring the bell at the top. Or likewise, if they're, they don't like my off-brand not quite dinosaur shaped nuggets and it's running into the ground. I got to know when to say enough is enough and pull the plug so I don't blow this up for my family. You're exactly right. I mean, you're exactly right about all of that. And, you know, and I, I don't know the degree to which the break even scenario is different for franchises than for, you know, an existing mom and pop business, but it's absolutely true that, you know, you, you, you just because a franchise brand has systems in place and has guardrails and has best practices, you know, it can only take you so far. I mean, at a certain point, you are your own boss and you are your own business and you are making a lot of the decisions yourself. And, you know, moving from break even to a higher levels of profit, you know, at a certain point is really no different for a franchisee than it is for anybody else because, you know, you're still having to run and operate this business. You know, you have different, different kinds of expenses and different kinds of, uh, you know, people helping you and whatnot. But at the end of the day, a business is a business. And I, I don't, yeah, I don't want to overstate the degree to which franchising is separate and apart from every other kind of business. Because at the end of the day, you are a business owner and you are making those decisions and um, you have to live or, buy, or die by those decisions. And the brand will help you, hopefully. Um, and, and, and sometimes you can see examples of, okay, I'm stuck in break even, and I've been here for a year and a half. Uh, how are other franchise owners in my system breaking through that more? Because other people have been through it. I mean, so, so that is the, the one, the one bit of difference is that you can go back and you can draw on examples of exactly with the same systems, the same tools, the same product. You know, how has somebody else managed to make that leap? So, you know, you do have, you do have that, but at the end of the day, you're the owner of the business and you have to make these decisions. Just one other thing I want to touch on before we finish, because I didn't even know this existed, but Matt had brought it up to me before we recorded this idea of you can actually use retirement money to fund these in certain situations. And I believe it's called Rob's or something like that. Can, I don't know which one he wants to take it, but can one of you just talk about what that program is and how it works? So we should just say there's a lot of ways to finance any business purchase acquisition and specific to franchises. Some of the more common things that we've seen people explore are you could, if you can't pay for it from cash or with existing investments, it has become popular in recent years to look at uh, the Rob's program, which is a rollover for business startup. There's a bunch of caveats to this. This is very, very much a do not try this at home or on your own kids. You can get yourself into some trouble. It really turns into a conversation around, because what you're doing is you're basically doing a rollover out of retirement plan. So qualified money, and you're going to use that to purchase all the shares in a C corporation. So you're starting this business and you're basically going to hold it in the retirement account. Great. If that thing goes boom really fast and goes off to the races, there's still some issues on the sales side of things, but not so great if it goes bust. And there's a ton of middling scenarios on the break even that you got to really be aware of. So depending on your balance sheet and your sources of capital, you can borrow money. You can take money from existing investments. You can take loans against some 401ks and things. You can even do a Rob's program, a rollover out of the plan to fund this startup. They are all super specific to you. And you never do this stuff without help from others. Uh, but I think the real point of this is you got a lot of options available. If this is something you want to explore, start talking to some people. I'm just curious, Matt, with the Rob's thing, in terms of like actually making money yourself, because you don't want all the money obviously going into a retirement account because you have to pay your bills and stuff. You can, 
I assume you can pay yourself a salary and then if there's dividends from the business, those go into the retirement account. Is that how it works? Yeah, it gets it gets quirky fast. And the accounting for the valuation of the shares on the purchase and on an ongoing basis, that's the stuff where the way deeper conversation that we can have in this. But yeah, think about it. Like if I work for the company, my salary potentially might draw other distributions can get paid to me as an expense of the business. That's separate from my actual ownership stake in the business, which is inside of my retirement account. That's special for this. So to your point, effectively, you can still get money. You can still get paid and have money that now gets taxed on the outside. But my equity ownership is held inside of that wrapper. All right, Ben, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, jumping on with us. A uh, different subject, but I certainly yeah. learned a lot and I'm sort of glad we end ended with some of those planning um, related questions. Uh, ben, if people want to contact you to, uh, you know, maybe tap your knowledge or learn more about how you work with people that are interested in franchises, where can they go to learn more? Absolutely. So I am uh, one of a number of owners of within the FranNet franchise system. Um, I I don't know if you want me to give you my phone number and my email address here, but uh, FranNet, F-R-A-N-N-E-T dot com uh, is the website. Um, and there are FranNet uh, office owners around the country. I'm able to help anybody around the country, but I focus here in the Midwest, but I'm always happy to uh to take a phone call to take an email uh set up a time to talk to me um you know uh this is i mean my services are completely free by the way uh it's an executive recruiting model so i i i don't work for any one particular brand i i help individuals look for ideas learn about what makes them tick their goals and all of that and then um look for for ideas to show them and and, and, and give them tools on how to walk through the process Happy to talk with anybody uh, who who may have an interest in in exploring this further. And Great, my compliments to Ben because Ben's where I go when I have questions about this stuff uh, for clients and other people. So just the educational side of this, if you're interested, talk to people like Ben. Absolutely happy to happy to talk with anybody that may be listening that that has questions about this. Even if you don't know if you are ready to do this yet and you just want to bounce around ideas, I mean. Let me know. I'm happy to help. Thanks, Ben. All right. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.